right, please stand for the pledge and turn off your cell phones. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, before we begin tonight, I wanted to recognize we have Mitchell Martin from Senator Patrick Galvin's office. He's uh, right over there. So after the meeting, feel free to reiterate how important it is to end the GEA to him, which I'm confident uh, Senator Galvin can do. So you can begin. Okay, we're going to start with a third grade academic presentation from Kelly LaRosa.
unexpected customer. Now let's admire the words. So I was thinking unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. Um sorry about that. In this um, session of the video, a uh, group of students are taking a look at the mystery text uh, that is being pulled right from the story that they're going to be working on. So they are um, asking and answering questions using complex text and specific details. They're also uh, using what the sentence says to help them determine what the word or phrases mean. And they're also engaging in effective collaboration discussions uh, building on ideas that they have and how to express them and how to express their own clearly with each other. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think his neck is pulled back. What does that mean? Neck is pulled back. He Do we have any questions? Um, I have a question. What does neck pulled back mean? Okay. So what does neck pulled back mean? Maybe the neck, maybe it's looking over its shoulder to see what it's gonna do next. Maybe it's going to launch out. Yeah. 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 In the next section, you will see the students working together to um, use the text to find evidence to answer some questions. They always listen to the story first with the teacher reading it to listen to fluency. They have now reread the text on their own in different sections. They capture the gist of those sections and then they work together. We were working on main idea and they're using the text again to find um, evidence of the details not only in the illustrations but also in the text. Now we have to go 
basically all just groups of three? No, it's all different. Um, with the carousel, I had showed, you had to show the class. We really wanted you guys to be able to hear the conversation going on within the groups. So they have pulled a group of three. It could be a group of five, it could be a group of four, it could be a group of two. Um, but it, one of the standards is to be able to have conversations with both their peers and adults. And you know the most the most exciting thing for me. I love what you did, by the way. I think that's just perfect. Mm -hmm. And and I and I recognize that some of these kids stayed after school to to help show. And so I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Is that if you notice that there was learning and teaching and discussion going on, and the teacher wasn't the one doing it, and that's the key. And and when I come in to observe and I see children talking to children and having discussion and conversation, that's the four in Charlotte Danielson that's exactly what it is is can they have conversation amongst each other like we do um, you don't talk to me and then and then I look at another student right it's just not what happens and so for a student to have a comment and then another student to respond to that student is exactly what we're after a really nice job thank you good job Sandy, did you have something? I do. Um, somewhere in this vast crowd is Amy Steger. Um, I am going to ask her to stand so everybody can see who she is. So thank you, Amy, for being here. And I know that you have some people that are with you as well. Amy is a teacher at the elementary school. She's a co-teacher part of the day and not uh, and has her own classroom, I believe, part the rest of the day. But the reason that Amy is here tonight is because she just recently was awarded the National Teacher Certification. National, te or National Teacher Certification, recognized by the board, has only been granted to approximately 1,700 students in New York State. And so I've been trying to poll people of how many teachers do you really think there are in New York State? Um, we're, we're pretty sure it's in excess of 
10,000, 12,000, and so I, I would be fair to say that it's less than 1%. Would that be true, Amy? Yeah, I'm looking for some acknowledgement for you because I know you know. Um, so out of 1,712 teachers in New York State as of December of 2014, Amy has earned that. To the best of our knowledge in our conversation, she is the first in Eden. Uh, that in itself it makes us really, really proud. I know that the teachers that I have spoken to about you said that this was a grueling process, that you didn't know that you'd actually earned it until you did, that you far exceeded the standard score, which is also pretty exciting, right? And that the um, components are such that what Amy had to consistently do was to reflect upon her own teaching, which is what we want teachers to do. And I don't think that in any of our careers that we've really been asked to do that as much. And so to reflect on teaching and to become a facilitator in the classroom as opposed to a teacher. I was really very fortunate to be in that classroom this week and I can tell you I would love to be a student in your class. I had fun, you were fun, um, I laughed and she has such a passion for the classroom. And so we're really, really proud of you. And you make Eden look good, which I always love. So thank you. Thank you. So if there's anybody that wants to say something about Amy, now's the time. I just basically said, you keep seeing classroom, I get to tell you she is a special ed teacher. I know, which yeah. Which was an enormous amount because she has multiple grade levels, plus what she does with Morgan is absolutely, and the numbers of kids, she's carrying this caseload, besides everything else she's doing, this is phenomenal. She's one of the great staff, even special ed. So. Absolutely, we agree. Thank you, Sean. Anybody else want to talk about Amy? <laughs> All right, she's free and clear. Good job, congratulations again. Okay, next item is athletics, Marissa Falacaro. Sixth graders 
that eventually up they are going to switch from soccer to football and their soccer program is going to suffer but at the current moment they still want to combine um, the harder part comes when you take two teams which is i think what was mentioned at the last board meeting when you take two school districts with two teams say soccer for instance since we canceled soccer um, take our girls soccer who had 12 you take North Collins girls soccer who had 17 you now have a roster of 29 kids 29 is not a feasible number so one school district will end up cutting their own taxpayers it is a it is a very sticky situation I personally don't recommend that that is why most schools um, when you look at the sports that they're combining for, they're combining for your big roster teams or your teams that might have the smallest interest or a team that's a new program. East Aurora just merged with Holland for wrestling. Holland's never had a wrestling team before. You take an indoor track. We've been asked a number of times, um, parents at our school would like indoor track. We don't offer it. It would be like us going with Lakeshore for those reasons. Um, those are the sticky situations. The other part is when you do merge teams, you have to take their beds numbers. Um, for football, it kept us at a B. We were still at a B. If we ever merged for, say, basketball, and we combined with North Collins, we would now be in an A school that would have us competing against uh, Hamburg, uh, Lakeshore, um, a Williamsville South, a Williamsville East and you would see our very good records um, go down to losing, which is also a big problem in um, maintaining a sports program. So, Can I ask a question? Sure. I, I think for the longest time we felt that you couldn't cut your own kids, mm -hmm. and then as we researched, researched, was there a change in the in the? There was a change in mm -hmm. the law, and it's basically from the school districts that I contacted, um, because combining of schools five years ago was not heard of. Um, the declining enrollment of schools in the financial crisis that schools are in have led to those decisions. So the state had to go in and set forth the laws for combining of schools. They understand it, um, but a lot of the districts are turned off as far as that of cutting their own tax. So now you I can, but it's not recommended. Yes, it's, it's not recommended by a lot of them. Um, ice hockey seems to be the most common for two teams. Um, to combine, and that's primarily because an ice hockey team is usually a $30,000 um, sports program, so it's an expensive venture that most school districts don't have. Um, if you do look at our numbers for the current season, despite our, again, declining enrollment, we're actually right on par. We're down about 15 kids here or there. Um, the fall numbers, just so you know, we're 20 kids higher, but we did receive 20 kids Can from this challenge. So just have that in your head. I don't want anybody to I don't know how to make it move. Watching the numbers at all. Um, what questions can I answer for you on combining? What other teams do you think we can combine besides football? No. Um, oh, the problem would be if you looked at, like, say, field hockey. Field hockey would ideally be a great one because nobody around us has it uh, as far as Lakeshore or North Collins. The problem with the field hockey would be I would now, if I had called Lakeshore and said, would you be interested? They might have two kids that they would have interested, but now I have to take their beds numbers of 650, which now pushes me up to an A school, which now takes my, usually a team that makes it to the semis every year, possibly finals every year, might not even win. And I'm just saying that I'm not sure on that one. Um, we could look at some of our smaller teams that don't have roster full sizes. Um, it might be a golf. I don't believe North Collins has a golf team. Lakeshore does have a golf team. When I call, I did call North Collins this year um, very late. We are supposed to have the deadline. We are supposed to have the application in a year in advance, but because our bowling numbers were a little bit lower this year, um, I called North Collins and um, offered them a trial run. Because um, they don't have a bowling they team. They don't have a bowling team, they have a bowling club, and they were not interested because their fear was they would lose basketball players to bowling, and again, they did not want to see their numbers go down. Does North Collins have an athletic director? Yes, I believe she's just like me. She's a teacher on special assignment. Mm -hmm. 
how long she been there? Um, not too long because their former AD left and is now the principal of Pioneer. So I want to say a year and a half. Who's a former AD in grad? Billy Widener. Yeah. 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 Um, former AD. Um, that's it. It's something we do look at. It's just very hard. A football roster, you have to remember, has. You can have 50 kids and it, it is great. You can have only offensive team, a defensive team, a special team. Um, you look at a basketball team or a soccer team, you have 11 kids on the field. You can only have your varsity roster max out at 20. Um, it's all so different. It's very hard when, it, when you take those smaller teams and try to combine them. But what you said, what I heard you say is that you have seen a difference at the section level of them approving combining of Correct. schools. We yeah. do have um, some of your schools, um, some of your bigger schools, it has been brought up again. They don't like the ratios. If you look at um, the second briefing right there, it tells you the ratios. I have to take 50% of your beds numbers or 40% of your beds numbers, which is why it was able to keep us for North Collins merging at um, a B school. Um, there are people within ECIC and Section 6 that are challenging this with the state because unfortunately for football especially, you have um, some teams that are building powerhouse teams. They're merging four teams together. They're not doing it for the financial reason or the declining enrollment reason. They're doing it for the win reason. So right now, these uh, percentages are actually up at the end of June, and we're waiting to see what the state is gonna do with that. If it goes back to 100%, I would tell you that I would be very leery on merging for football. Which is why we only do it one year at a time. We are the smallest B school, and to make us an A school would be very <laughs> not right. Um, so that's why you only do it a year at a time. And again, state put it for the reason of declining numbers and financial reasons. Questions for Marissa? No, no, no. Okay. Any other questions for Marissa? I know that this was a request. This will be this will be brought up again during budget season, as I'll give my opinion on um, other ways of handling it. But this is just the kind of to fill you in a little bit on it. But unfortunately, the two teams that we did have cut, we are working with the one uh, not cut. I'm sorry that we had to drop um, the soccer option. It, it's tough. Lakeshore has soccer, Hamburg has soccer, North Collins has soccer, and the football option, I think it'll change with our numbers for next year. I think we're in a good spot for football for next year with the approval of North Collins. Okay, we good? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Marissa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, request to withdraw specific items from consensus items, A through M. Okay, no, no requests. <clears throat> I move that the following consensus items be approved as listed in the administrative memorandum, A through M. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstentions, motion carries. Okay, uh, two minute statements from the public. Anybody wish to speak? Please, please come forward. let the Corn Festival use our grounds free of charge and over 20 organizations in the town depend on that for fundraisers. Some of them are eating Little Loop football, uh, eating all sports boosters, fire department, chamber of commerce, the list goes on. The Legion provides the land and utilities for the Eagle Little Loop football and the Eagle Little League baseball. We built a swimming pool for the town. The basketball courts for town residents use. 
the last 10 years, the Legion has put up and taken down and maintained all the flags on Main Street, replacing the ones that were bad. The Legion also donates money to support our community and organizations. In 2013, we donated over $46,000 to different organizations. We paid over $42,782 in taxes. Since 1962, the Legion and Ladies Auxiliary have awarded over $80,000 in school scholarships for the Eden residents. That's not counting the Sons of the American Legion. I don't have their numbers. Our Honor Guard performs at many functions and funerals. In 2013, they spent 1,175 man hours. And in 2014, they're already up to 1,394. They would be here tonight, except they were requested by Chris Jacobs to be at the ceremony at the Erie County Hall. Otherwise, you'd see all of them here. When I say the Legion, I mean the men and women from our community who put on a uniform and took an oath to protect and defend this great country. I saw a great bumper sticker once. It said, if you can read this, thank your teacher. If you can read it in English, thank your veterans. Remember, if it wasn't for the sacrifices of our veterans, you would not be able to sit here and voice your opinions. You'd be told what to do and that's it. When our country asked, we stood tall even when it wasn't the proper, popular thing to do. We're now asking you to do the right thing, and stand tall and honor our sacrifices by granting these exemptions. We also, to this year to date, we've given over $23,000 to the wounded warriors, healing waters, disabled vets, and homeless vets. So that's all we're asking is to honor the sacrifices that we all gave for this community, this, our country. And it's not that big a thing. Honor us by granting us this exemption. I believe we deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder. Uh, it is two minutes, and we're going to try to stick to the two minutes. So when you hear the beep, time's up. Anyone else? <laughs> Come on. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Mike Best. I've been a driver for the district for about 11 years. Uh, to start off, quick to say thanks to all the veterans here and to all the younger students here today. If you could just take a little time on your iPod or, or uh, computer and look up the Battle of the Bulge. Um, it was fought 70 years ago today. Um, you'll see what a sacrifice those men did, in, men and women in that battle. Um, my uh, reason to be here today is uh, as a driver, and speaking for the drivers, we have um, got information that perhaps we're being contracted out again that's being looked into um, we see the buses um, we're in sorry shape right now we've got about eight of them that bump DOT and it, it, it's just coming across as geez are we just being uh, let everything just kind of fall apart and say well okay guys you're we can't replace it anymore we're too far gone so 95% of us, probably even more, are all Eden residents. We're taxpayers. We volunteer for organizations. Um, we've coached. We serve on town boards. We, we do a lot of different things. Do we have drama there? Yes, we do. We have attitudes, but it's, it's not the majority. Most of us are are out here trying to do the best we can and we take we treat the kids like we would our own um, 
So we hope that we will be given a consideration and I hope that we can get our fleet back to we had we had one breakdown today that we had borrowed from Lake Shore. I mean it's just it's getting it's getting bad. And the mechanic said that the uh, we can't even get uh, tires recapped anymore because the casings are are old. We don't replace the buses, so the casing on the tires are too old to even recap them. So um, basically, that's all I wanted to say. We we're just very concerned that this was going on again, and we thought the ship would sail, but again, it might be back on the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Two minutes. Good. Anyone? Good. Okay, new business. Mr. President. I, I have a motion. I would like to make a motion. Who said motion first? <laughs> I move that we adopt a resolution pursuant to New York State Real Property Law Section 458A to allow certain veterans of the Armed Forces of the United States to be eligible for partial tax exemptions in the manner and to the extent provided by the state law equivalent to the veterans exemption cap level C, 6,000, 10,000, 20,000. Second. Discussion. I'd, I'd like to ex explain a little bit, and I'm sure you, you will want to address it, Paul. Uh, let me go first. Um, as everybody knows here, we've, we've kicked this around for a long time. We've, we've talked about it. We've debated it. My motion is an attempt to try to bring this board together, uh, if not unanimously, at least to a consensus, and get this resolved tonight. And. I, the resolution I just made, the motion I just made, was the same one that was adopted by Niagara Wheatfield last week. Uh, and I'll tell you how I personally got to this point in, into making this recommendation. I was trained both as a lawyer and as a judge uh, to make decisions not on emotion, but on analysis and deliberation. So from the very beginning, I've tried to do this with this law. And it was passed late last year by the governor and the legislature. And, and the motivation there, uh, and this is not really debated, the motivation was to gain some favor with voters right before the coming election year. And the really politically shrewd part, and I, I don't mean that as a compliment, the politically shrewd part was that the state passed it, but they didn't pay for it. They didn't pay, they didn't provide any funding for it. They passed that on down to us. So they pass the law, they get the credit for it with the voters, but the bill gets passed down to the local school districts. So right from the beginning, the politics of it was distasteful to me. And, and I thought, is this a genuine attempt to honor and thank veterans, or is it something else? Uh, and if it is that, is this the best way to go about doing that? It's, the state law essentially sets up a, a hodgepodge of a system where only property owning veterans in certain districts get some benefit. Uh, other property owning veterans in other districts might get more. Uh, other property owning veterans in other districts might get nothing. Uh, d does that make sense? Does that sound fair and equitable? Uh, I think, and this has been said by others uh, throughout, what, whatever needs to be done here needs to be done on a statewide or a federal level and funded that way, not in this crazy hodgepodge uh, school district type of thing. I also don't like how this law places us, the board members, in an inherent conflict. We were elected to represent all constituents of the district. Okay, not to pick and choose and decide whether some should pay less tax at the expense of others. And I don't like how it pits constituent against constituent here, as it has in this district. And, and by the way, when this law was initially passed, uh, actually earlier this year, this, there was a statewide poll done of, of 
school board members as to whether they thought it was a good law or not. Almost 70% of school board members said no. 70% said no. 10% were undecided and about 20% supported it. So <clears throat> what's changed from that point? Did it magically transform into good law at some point? Or are people making decisions based on emotion? And, and believe me, it would be very easy to, to make this decision on emotion. Uh, veterans deserve our undying gratitude every day for their service. And in, in this community, as you just heard, they mean, even, they mean even more to us because the Legion and the VFW are the bedrock of this community. They support us still, and they are still serving. So if the question here was, should we honor, support, thank our veterans? That's, that's a pretty easy question to answer. But that's not the question that's before us. We have a law here that was designed as a political gimmick, and it is dividing us. And yet, ironically, uh, our leadership is supposed to do exactly the opposite of that. It's supposed to unite us. In the hearings that we had, there were some speakers that made some really good points on both sides. But the one that stays with me, and the one I'll always remember, was Commander Blighty from the Legion. And we just heard it again from this gentleman tonight. And I'm paraphrasing, but he stood up and said very simply, we support the community, we'll always support the community, no matter whether you support this or not, we'll support the community. Now that's leadership. That's leadership. You know, and our governor could take a lesson from that. So I've, I've had these concerns about the law, and I, I think I've been pretty consistent since the beginning, and I've expressed them. And, and we did months ago, we passed a unanimous resolution on this board objecting to the way this law was crafted and requesting state funding. And uh, it got some pretty wide um, play in, uh, around the state. It was written up in some state publications. So we know that they know about this, uh, but we've had absolutely no response from the state, no response to that whatsoever. And subsequent to that, to that resolution, then we had um, the board here made a motion to put the issue to the public, to a non-binding referendum. And I opposed, I opposed that. And I opposed it because I thought and I felt that we were elected to make decisions, not to punt. And I didn't want the expense. But uh, obviously the vote went forward. And there was a public vote, and, and we can argue about the turnout and, and the meaning of, of that and so forth, but it was a public vote, uh, and I think that's entitled to some weight. So that gets me to, to this motion that I'm making. Um, it is an attempt to compromise, and like any real compromise, it guarantees that no one will be happy because it, it passes the exemption, but not at the levels hoped for And I just want to thank everyone who participated in this process, in the hearings and so forth, in, in what has been, for the most part, a pretty civil level-headed debate. You know, people have, have stood up and advocated for their positions, and there has been mutual listening and respect. Uh, that's the American way, and that's a credit to this community. And at this point, I, I would ask my fellow board members to join me in supporting this motion. The comments I had about that is that when we did put it out for the non-binding referendum, we had selected numbers, and those numbers went out to the public. We sent postcards to everyone in the district, notifying them of the vote with that wording on it of what the numbers were. We then held a vote with that dollar amount listed on the ballot, which everybody had an opportunity to read and vote on and then 
the vote came back as you well know with uh, the majority in favor with the written dollar amounts on the ballot that we had suggested. We did not take the top of the line that we could have as in the emails that were just emailed to us we could have selected four levels higher than we did. The level we did select was pretty much in the middle of the levels we could have chosen from. It is also exactly what the Town of Eden and Erie County grants to the veterans now as the exemption on that side, on real property side of taxes. That's my comment on that matter. My concern on this is, I guess it looks to me as we're switching the rules after the, in the middle of the game here. We went out for a non-binding vote. The public voted 65% to, I don't even remember now, 35%. Uh, they spoke. Everyone was informed. We sent out mailers, penny saver. Someone had signs in their lawn. Someone put information on people's cars at church, uh, which was filled with inaccurate information as it was. But anyways, there's no excuse for it. People had the opportunity to vote, and they voted. I think we should respect that. Uh, ultimately, uh, I will support this, but I still would say Paul should make a motion also. Because we got to get this done tonight. Well, I don't think we'd have two motions on the floor at the same time. Well, we will have another motion. You can't. You have one motion on the floor at a time. So you have to do something. Okay, so with then this. I guess we'll have to hear this motion. Either that or we can. I can make a motion to set aside. Collins motion. Well, if there's no further discussion, I'd ask for a vote. Let's see where we are. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstention? Aye. Abstain? I'm sorry, can I get a head count on that? Just so I'm that was that four to three. Back. Four to two. Yeah. To one. Colin, Barb, hey. Mike, anybody else? I'll be a no. Be. Yeah, I'm a no. Scott, Scott you're a yes? Yep. Okay. I don't know that they know what you have. I have uh, voting yes, Colin Campbell. Barb Henry, Mike Breeden, Scott Henderson, voting no, Paul Shepard, Patty Krause, Mike Burns. I guess I would like to put on record also to changing it during the middle of the game here like that. I find it very inappropriate and not fair to the public, not fair to us other board members. Um, I'm with Mike and Paul on this. Okay, um, resignations. I move that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the resignation for the purpose of retirement of senior clerk stenographer Judith Ludwig be accept accepted effective February 9th, 2015. The board and administration wish to thank Mrs. Ludwig for her 38 and a half years of service to the district. Second. Discussion? Um, Is she here? No, she is not here. So Judy Ludwig has been with us for a really long time and carries a position that is one of a kind. She is responsible with the technology department for most of the data, if not all of the data, for students. And I know that it's going to be an incredible loss. Um, due to um, CSEA contract, we cannot rehire in that position until her effective date is done, which is February 9th, but her physical last date is January 2nd. And so in the turning over of the semesters, this is going to be rather interesting, um, and we're still not quite sure how we're going to make up for Judy. She's one of a kind. She's been incredibly indispensable. She is as type A as you need someone to be in that position and can be um, just there for the teachers, there for the administrators, there for the technology department. And so even in her absence, I would ask for an applaud of Judy because I, 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 it's a true loss, true loss.
Yeah, she's quite impressive. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Okay, uh, moving down to C, I move that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the standard work day and reporting resolution for the treasurer be approved as presented. Second. Discussion. This is just something that our treasurer is required to do every year, just for quarter hours. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. I move that upon the recommendation of the superintendent a donation of a KitchenAid stand mixer with all the attachments for use in the junior, senior, high school, family, and consumer science class valued at $200 be accepted from Michelle Byrne. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Is Michelle Byrne here? here? Okay. Is this the second one we've received? Yep, there might be a third coming too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gotta have more wow. than one in the kitchen. <laughs> I move that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, a donation of a red KitchenAid stand mixer and a silver artisan KitchenAid stand <coughs> mixer, both with all the attachments, plus microfiber towels and wash rags valued at $750, be accepted from Paula Farrell. Second. second. Discussion? And I know Paula's here. Yeah, she That's is. the second one Paula's donated, right? Yeah. Paula, are you not cooking anymore or what? <laughs> you have your own? Barb had a question. Thank you. No, I said that's the second and third. There were two in that There's two in that one. Yeah, there's two in that one and I had one last week. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I need one. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. And thank you. I move that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the interscholastic athletic sharing agreement combining Eden and North Collins football be approved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. I'd just like to thank Marissa for bringing in the extra information that was. Uh, she always does. It's good. Thanks, Marissa. I move that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the 2014-2015 appropriations be increased by $6,861.86 to $26,464,259.97 to account for increased revenues. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Okay, moving on to information and proposals, uh, business report. Okay, uh, first for me, uh, number one, I wanted to thank everyone at th this table and some of the community members who are on that side of the table. We had our first budget advisory team meeting um, and it actually went very well. We looked at what worked well last year, uh, what were some potential changes that people were looking at for this year, and then we reviewed some information, some basic information to get us started, uh, looked at the schedule for the coming year, and the volume of work which we'll have ahead of us for this year's coming budget. So thank you very much, everyone in advance, for the hours and hours of work of which you will be putting in. So thank you. Um, transportation which is, um, I, I just wanted to follow up on what was asked for at the last meeting. Um, there was a comment from the audience as well in regards to the contracted services. Looking at our fleet and the condition of our fleet right now, the question came up from the board at the last meeting, what is the cost of a contracted um, bus? The, we are looking at two different figures right now and they're almost right on with each other. Uh, Fisher bus was at $50,000 for a contracted bus and at Orchard Park right now is at 49,000 is what they said they were paying for theirs. So that's what you're looking at just roughly from a figure. If we're looking at our own bus, I mean you're really looking at obviously the cost of the driver um, and then of course the maintenance cost uh, for the bus as well. So. Uh, Yes. Just let me clarify, when we sure. rent a bus for 50000 that includes the driver with it? That includes the driver. Okay. I thought it was just the bus. And all the maintenance and... Just to confirm, it is driver and bus. It is I think you can use, use the right words, though. 
uh, it, it is a complete package that you're getting uh, when you contract out for the bus. So when you contract out for the bus, it is the bus, the driver that is provided, for example, if it's from Fisher as well. Well, I've gone That's to correct. some of these conventions and they've talked, I've talked with some of the bus busing companies and they said, oh, we'll let you use your own drivers. You just, now what, tell me about that a little bit. They would hire our drivers. They would hire our drivers? And that would be the driver included in the 50,000, is that correct? So would they be under a different contract then? They, they would actually be hired by the company, whichever company that you, that you that, would have. That's how they do it? And would they be compensated the same or would it be less? That's what I just said. Okay. More right. likely, more just likely it'd probably be less. Yeah. I would like to also add, like I did last time, that before we go any further that we investigate districts that have switched because I know that Pioneer, uh, the teachers and the coaches are not happy at all with the contract. They no longer are able to schedule their field trips when they want to. They have to wait till the company is done doing the runs in the morning for all the districts they pick up. They're no longer able to schedule their sporting events same thing they have to wait till the bus company does all the runs in the afternoon to schedule any meets be it swimming soccer field hockey or away meets um, I know that they have been scheduled for a certain pickup time and not been there on the time that they're supposed to which ruins field trips for students I know that there has been problems also with drivers not being familiar with where they're going as far as sporting events, getting the teams there late, which gets the meet started late, which messes the student schedules up for homework, messes the parents' schedules up. Um, so I would like to really hear from districts that have done this because once we do not have buses anymore, the initial contract might be very sweet, but when we have to renew it and we don't have buses anymore, we have nothing to negotiate with then. We're at the mercy of those companies. So I would like to hear from districts. And I think what we can also do is hear from other companies as well. Uh, we know obviously with the buses and the condition which are in right now, we're finding ourselves in a tough spot. Of number one, getting through this year and having adequate supply of buses moving forward. Um, as it just so happens today, at our business officials meeting, we had a wonderful presentation to talk about the various options of, again, leasing, purchase, um, and, and all the different ways of, of having a fleet. And probably what we can actually do um, is maybe in January, February, I, I could drive for January if we want, and almost have a company or two come in and kind of talk to us and say, here's what the options are. Here is the potential mixes of what you're looking at. Because again, as we look ahead at the budget and what we're able to afford, it's gonna be a mix of probably a lot of different things to number one, get us through the remainder of the year and then put us on a path. It's not going to be a very cut, dry, simple, we're done. Um, so probably what would benefit everyone is if we had a couple of people come in and actually give us a presentation based on our fleet Here's what we're actually looking at now. Here's the average age of our fleet. Um, and then here's the different ways of structuring it moving forward. So looking at financing options, things along those lines. So I think it's important to note that we did purchase, uh, we, we did put a proposition out and the voters did pass for us to purchase two buses last year that had been the first proposition in a number of years for buses. So there was a support certainly by the board and then the voters to, to bring in two buses. What we did not anticipate is the number of buses that were going to fail DOT this year. Uh, we didn't know that that was going to happen and certainly we've had some conversations about moving forward and in looking at a budget and looking at how many buses down we are is as Tom was saying is what are our options moving forward and it may not just be one option it may be a number of different options and included in that too and looking down the line is conversation that I hear as our enrollment uh, certainly is at a level that's not stabilized right now of a single run versus a double run. And so what does that mean to us as we look forward to? So 
uh, I, I think it's a really good idea to start to find out what are all the options. And, so, and if it was a conversation at ASBO, we can't be the only district in this position. Not even by long right. shot. I mean, they were talking about all the districts that yeah. really are hurting right now for buses. And Barb, one of the things you brought up in the budget advisory team meeting is, can we delve deeper into some issues? This is a perfect way at a board meeting to have a presentation where we can actually really get into the meat of it and start looking at what are our options. Mm -hmm. So when we get to the budget advisory, then we've got that information that we're armed with as well so I'll start working on that and then we can hear from them as well question um, does yeah. uh, does I mean BOCES offers a lot of services do they have someone that does transportation and looks at transportations or you know, well they do have to help them with this because I'm assuming like you said we're not in the only one in, uh, in this boat I mean is there someone that John O'Connor bringing in a finance company or, or, or I mean because you'd have to bring in almost three different people that might be biased one way or the other. I was wondering if BOCES or someone in John the John O'Connor is in, in charge of BOCES too in terms of transportation services and we've certainly been working with him. Okay. And then ASBO, which is the business officials that Tom is, is more Western New York, right? It's not just BOCES too. Well, the, the meeting today actually was BOCES put this one together. So BOCES, BOCES one and two? Uh, this is BOCES two that we're at today, so John O'Connor. And he, uh, they actually had companies come in and present. And deliberately so. So you okay. have a couple different perspectives. Right. So even though they have that, they wanted people to hear from the companies themselves because that's who you're working with as well. Right. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, whether they're selling buses, leasing buses, or right. outsourcing buses. Because they're they finding the same thing over the course of the ca past couple of years. So with the fiscal crisis that we have and with less money in terms of what we can use in districts, I'm sure all these bus companies are seeing the exact same thing happening with them, is districts with less money and not wanting to put out a number of buses to to the residents to vote on and really finding that their fleet is aging and one other question this was sort of uh, kind of off topic but about about busing there's been a lot of press of late about um, delaying the opening of the high school because it's it's better for the students if they start later and, and you're seeing a lot of studies and, and pros and cons to that um, and if we did go to a, a later start like maybe with the elementary and a GOP I mean, would that be conducive to one bus run? Granted, there's whole issues there, but you know, would that make air lights easier from a, a transportation, so to speak? You would need more buses to do a single run. Okay. okay. You would save money on mileage every day. So there's pluses and minuses. Um, I actually was able to do a later start at my last district for both the elementary and the high school, which certainly played into uh, VOTAC, which was intriguing because now we were starting our day later and bumping into more of the VOTAC day uh, and causing our school day to end later, which then bumps into sports. Uh, there are school districts who have flipped them from elementary and high school. We certainly talked about some of that in terms of half days. What we know is that in Eden District is that our, many of our older students are responsible for babysitting their younger siblings. And so having our, our elementary students go home before the high school students has already caused a little bit of angst. So th there's a good and bad in all of it. This worthy of a conversation, yeah. There is no doubt that we all get up way too early at the secondary level. We all do. Five o'clock is pretty much standard. Just a thought. <laughs> and the last thing, unless there's more on transportation right now. Okay. The last thing that I just at least want to mention, uh, this is a topic that we'll be hearing more about throughout the year. Uh, Paul, you probably can also talk to us a little bit as well. Um, BOCES Capital Project. As you guys recall from last year, um, BOCES had uh, a couple small capital projects of which they were working on. It was a million dollar project uh, for this year and a million dollar project for last year. And what we're looking at is oh, for BOCES buildings, um, they're, they're aging, just like our buildings. So with our students going into their buildings, sometimes it isn't always the safest of conditions, just as in here with our building conditions, everyone looking to see what updates we need to make. There are a lot that they need to make. So what they've done for these two years is just really stop gap measures, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong at any point, but just stop gap measures to do some immediate things, uh, but looking at a much larger 
fix for all of their buildings down the line. Nothing fancy, just health and safety type of issues. Um, so whereas this year's a million, next year's a million, and, and that affects each district. For us, it was about $40,000 each year for these two years. They're talking at a larger, about a $24 million project, which would take care of those health and safety items. Now for us, we wouldn't be talking until I believe it's about 20, 2018 that they're even talking that if they do it, that's when financing for us would actually begin. <coughs> um, but what does that mean? That means if a BOCES project were to go forward, we're all component districts. We could uh, do this a couple different ways. Every district could vote unanimously to go forward with the BOCES capital project. Um, that means a certain type of financing structure. It could be done even if not every district does unanimously uh, vote to do it. They all come with different price tags. Now, as we go forward in the year, we'll probably have visits from BOCES here to talk a little bit about the project, what's actually involved. Um, but just letting everyone know that what that actually would mean for us is that we will actually start to see if that goes forward, um, regular payments, debt service payments, in our annual budget. Um, and so that would start to at least 2018, but we're talking anywhere from the figures they're actually providing for us, anywhere from about, um, well, let's see, 101,000 in, in one scenario, if we put money down, because we can pay just like if we're gonna do something here, we could put 10% down, 20% down each district. Our, our payments would go down maybe to 75,000 if we put 20% down. A lot of questions still to come, but at least I wanted to give everyone a heads up because this is something that I think BOCES needs to do and is actually going to be doing. Uh, it's just how will it actually be done, what will it look like, and what will it mean for every district. So, so it carries four, four, BOCES centers, so Carrier and Lakeshore, Hughes, Laguitas, and what's the fourth one? Ormsby. Ormsby and East Aurora. So it carries all four buildings. This will not impact us on the coming budget. So the 40 that we had in our budget last year will still be the case roughly for this year as well. It's based on our water, but it's roughly going to be about the same. So it won't impact us on next year, but it would in about 2018. So. Um, the vote, though, I believe, would be sometime this year, probably on that. I don't know. I have not no, heard I don't definitive think it will, on that. I don't think, think it so will either. be this year. Maybe next year. Okay. Yeah. I think, the, I think it will be pre presented because it's still in the developmental phase. Okay. Yep. Uh, they're surveying the buildings to see what is priority, similar to the survey that we're doing. Is is uh, I mean, is there a possibility? I, I mean, I know we're not the only district is shrinking in size. Um, with excess buildings and, and such like that, um, you know, some have given up buildings, closed buildings, or, or schools. Um, I mean, is there a possibility that Bozies could reuse or rent space, which would be financially good to the district? Great uh, question. Um, instead of yep. you know, they do money into their buildings. So, so so far, they do rent rooms, and we do have a few rooms that are rented by Bozies and yep. have. Um, each year they have also had some conversation about putting some programs back into certain districts so for example um, I'll use Holland as a good example because they they actually have an open building that they right. closed down so that has been big conversation if we go back though to the reason why uh, component districts or a home district like ours actually sends our kids to BOCES it's because the overhead of having some of those very specialized programs in our own districts was way too expensive Expensive. And so there will always be that um, need for these locations that are more centralized to cut the cost down for everybody. So it's a little bit of both. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I realize the, the need yeah. for both I'm, I'm not saying to go yeah. to I'm just saying no, they have, to Bozies yeah. reuse schools instead yep. of sinking money into their infrastructure. Yep. They've actually, we've actually had some conversation with them here too in terms of our technology because we have such a beautiful technology space. Okay. Yep. Just a thought. It's a good thought. Is that for me? Is that for you? Right. I do have a few things to, to just bring in that are not on the memorandum. One of the conversations that the administrators and I have started to have, and also the ETA Exec Council, is some type of a uh, plan for early go-homes due to weather. 
Um, right now, what happens is we have students, if, if there's a turnaround, like the bus can't get to their home, or their parents aren't there um, to pick them up because roads are closed, that they come back to all three buildings. So we are starting to take a look at, since we don't trust the weather anymore, it's been really good for a long time, but I don't have any faith in it anymore, is um, trying to come up with a plan that would be perhaps one building maybe closer to Route 62, so maybe the elementary school where it's closer to the Boys and Girls Club, boys closer to Tim Hortons, or two buildings or so, and, and, and taking a look at people who live closer in the district that, that or don't have children that would volunteer to stay just in case some of these buses turn around. So I'll keep that in um, your head so that you understand what it looks like, too. And then our superintendent advisory council has, which are made up of students in grades seven through nine and 10 through 12, uh, the 7 through 9 Superintendent Advisory Council has offered to create games and look for volunteer students who might be live on Hillbrook or so that might even agree to stay and, and work with kids. And so Friday I meet with the older Superintendent Advisory Council and they may be interested in doing the same. One of the board members, I believe it was Patty, a couple of board members a, a couple of meetings ago had a question regarding the quality of the cafeteria food. Pat McKenna did meet with the older kids and is starting to create a survey that will be given to all of the students in the district in terms of the amount of food, the quality of food, the difference from before to now, keeping in mind that some of it was based on federal regulation changes. And then just the other day, I met with the seventh through ninth graders. I thought what was interesting in that, and it might, I, I don't know the reason for it, reasons are really important, but the seventh through ninth graders scored the food lower than the 10th through 12th graders. So what that means, I don't know. Um, okay, um, the they didn't food. like the same food, I don't know. <laughs> I know there's certain things they really don't like. Um, uh, Greece seemed to be one of the big issues that came out of even the foods that they did like. So I will keep you informed on that as well. PTEC, I brought up the last time. Uh, uh, Sandy, real quick, yeah. on the food. Did yeah, I have something then too, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They, didn't they just pass with a new spending bill um, about a <sighs> revisit of the, the food yeah. at, the, at the federal level? They just passed it in the last spending bill. Which <laughs> because they're watching the trend of nobody two eating days ago. it. Yeah. yeah, a few days ago, how yeah. they, they'll be able to leverage more carbohydrates and, and such. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't read the whole detail, but and it gives a little yeah. bit more flexibility to the I, I, It'll be interesting to see what type of flexibility it really gives us, because at the same time, we now have a vending machine that technically has... Um, what Barb and I deemed as healthy foods, but in the th some of it, because there were M&Ms down on the bottom, I'm not quite sure how those got there. It, it's sugar always free. interesting to see sugar-free M&Ms is, is how it starts and then what it actually looks like when it gets to us. Right. Yeah, okay. it, it's because the first bill really didn't look bad until it got to us, and then how is it? But I can say that in, in general, all the kids say this, we live in a community that produces food why can't we do better? And, and so it's a good topic, and we're going to continue to explore it. Any other questions? You okay, yeah. Paul? I do, and then Patty. Yeah. We did have a company come in here, Barb mm -hmm. and I, when we were at the conference last year, talked to a gentleman that, uh, what is the company's name, Tom? Mm. Preferred Meals. Preferred Meals. Oh, good job. They said that they <laughs> would try and buy as much local, remember when they said mm -hmm. that, as possible, plus their meals were prepared. They came in and they basically kind of like airplane type scenario. But what we sampled, at least my opinion, what I sampled at the conference was not bad tasting and it did not look unattractive either as far as how it was <laughs> presented. Well, being too, that's trying to be politically correct. I mean, I've seen some of the meals come out on trays, and sometimes it's interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, and they also said that the people that in the community that work here, they would try and keep those same personnel on. And we've had that company come here once, and they're willing to come back and do a presentation. And also, they were seeing they were willing to do some kind of audit to see if they would save us money on doing their food service versus the company we currently have. And that's a good point. And one of the things that we saw, Barb, go ahead. The best food is going to be from the women in this community that come and cook in our kitchen. That's the best food you're going to get. That's not what's happening now, though. I know. <laughs> well, I understand. I, I did speak with Debbie Dole. And I said maybe one of the things we could actually do at a future board meeting is actually have her come in 
and actually give us samples <laughs> of the food. And, uh, and what I've asked her, well, but what I've asked her to do is twofold. I've asked her to do uh, before the food standards and after the food standards and to show mm. how the food standards have, have changed it. the taste. Yeah. So if, if she were It's able, a whole wheat chocolate chip cookie. Correct. The weed has made such a difference. What would the same meal taste like if you didn't have the new standards? Well, that's the same as saying if she brings it to us, not saying that anybody would do this, but when you know your boss is coming, it might be different than on a daily basis. Could be. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's you're, you're the right. whole. That's the whole you're idea right. of the surprise visits. Yep. So surprise now under the board meeting at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is what I would say to you: is the people who work in our kitchens are wonderful, we'll and our kids on. have all said we'll that they on. love them dearly. Obviously so this is this is not about people. It's it's really not. They work hard. They love our kids. Uh, this is about the kids not liking what they're eating. But, but in some cases, some of the other ones love it. I don't know. In all fairness, uh, Paul, what I will say is this. So if, if she gives us this, a sample of the pre-standard and post-standard, you have we to have a eat student it. here as well. So if she does uh. a wonderful <laughs> job on the pre-standard and does a horrible job and makes the post-standard taste <laughs> horrible, she's going to know. She could do a like, blind test. test we I think we day. asked her, and she doesn't eat lunch here regularly. She brings her lunch. No, I'm not <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, so we at least have a student here to say, no, no, this is what she's serving us is not what we get every day. So we're so going to blind test something. her. Is this before or after okay. on um, the whole wheat cookie? We but that's but that's only one part of it. Mm -hmm. Number two, with preferred meals, and actually that's not bad to look at our options. But with the preferred meals, the one uh, major drawback of that is they drop the food off and say, here you go. Even if they hire our workers for the serving it, um, in terms of all the daily, making sure that we're meeting mm. all the safety regulations, the health regulations, they don't do any portion of so that. So you still so, need someone. So we still would have a person that we would have to hire as the food manager, which is a portion of you know, the contract we have right now, right. but you can't get away from that because you still have to. So, and then so you have foods that are not prepared that are more the a la carte, maybe? It's not just the entree. True. Uh, so, I mean, there's good and bad on both sides. I mean, so mm -hmm. it's not something that we shouldn't look at, but it's but there are some definite drawbacks for that one as well. So, I mean, it's if they can save money even after we hire someone in to run it, it's worth looking at. Patty? Uh, yeah, the question that I had was for the kids that are actually eating the lunch because they're hungry and they want to get the double lunch, did we look into... Is we did. Okay, and the answer? The answer um, was actually stated a couple of meetings ago. I think you answered it better than I can. It was, and I don't want to misstate it, but they can actually buy a second entree. But because it's subsidized, that's what's changing the price on the lunches and what they're able to get. Correct. I'd have to revisit right. it again, but I think it was like they couldn't buy, and, and maybe correct me. You can't get an actual there. double lunch for the same price correct. because it's subsidized by but the federal government. So in reality, because I as a parent, I've told my kid, and I don't care if it's wrong to say this here or not, but if you're hungry, just go back and buy another lunch. Just mm -hmm. don't buy it at the same time. Because in reality, <laughs> you're getting ripped off mm -hmm. if you're just getting the entree when you're buying the double lunch. So common sense would be eat it, go back and get a new one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to make that comment. Yeah. Okay. I don't eat lunch here. Me either. I don't find time to eat. Um, all right, are we good? Are we good? Were Colin? you going to address the, the capital project? I am. Okay. So PTAC first though. PTAC I brought up at the last board meeting. It's a wonderful opportunity. We're going to put out um, information flyers to all of our seventh and eighth graders. PTAC is an initiative that has come down uh, to help younger students who may be at risk in terms of high school and in college to really focus in on something that they're passionate about, which would be, uh, could be mechanical, could be engineering, could be, um, there's a number of, of different programs that PTEC is supporting, and it would take them on through their associate's degree. And it is a grant. Eden signed into this grant. We're committed to sending two students. Somewhere in January, there will be a um, informational meeting for parents and students or staff about what this means and how to apply for the PTEC grant. So we're looking at seventh and eighth grade students right now that it would continue on for them to receive their associate's degree. And it, and it is through um, working with businesses and associate college degrees. 
And then the capital project. All of you should have received, and many people in the audience um, may have, not everyone, because we're still working on it, is an invitation to be part of one of three committees going forward to the capital project. These three committees have stayed stagnant since the last time. There are still some invites that are going out, though. It's the Academic Organization Committee, which is comprised of answering questions regarding GLP and grade six. And then there is the site utilization, PE and athletics, which would deal with more outside, thus the site. And then the third one would be more technology and infrastructure. Our goal is a December of 2015 referendum that would go out to the public about a, about a capital project. The specifics of that capital project right now are health and safety, which you heard echoed regarding BOCES as well, because state ed will not allow you to do anything if you don't address health and safety. So masonry work would be health and safety, the location of our main offices, um, our electricity, all of those would, would fall into that. And then we would be looking also at academics and um, technology and other issues. It's gonna be a lot of work. I don't want anybody to be fooled that it's not. It's a lot of work. What I am hoping is that at one of the March board meetings that the board will make a decision regarding whether sixth grade continues to be taught at the elementary school or, or we look at creating a middle school and a high school within this complex and what the architects need to do to make that happen. Whether the sixth graders came in on their own time, still on the elementary bus, weren't in the hallway at the same time as anybody else, that's all things that we can certainly work out if people are concerned about younger students here, but looking at the idea of a middle school. The second one would be is what to do with GLP. And as we've stated, it's either to keep it as it is keep it as a pre-K two, but also use some of that extra space for actually offices or, or district space or a wraparound pre-K, or to uh, sell it completely. And those decisions all impact everything else. So that will be the first decision that comes before the board in March. Not an easy one to make, not an easy year, but a very exciting time. So did you have any other questions on that, Colin? No. Okay, okay, kickoff meeting in January, f especially for the Academic Organization Committee. I'm good. Okay, board report. All right, future dates, uh, BAT team meeting, January 21st, 2015, 545 p.m. here, uh, followed by the regular Board of Education meeting at 7 p.m. I move that the Board of Education anticipates entering executive session to discuss a matter identifying a disabled student which is made confidential by federal law, the employment history of a particular person or persons, ETA contract matters, and possible litigation. Second. Let's also add superintendent's contract to that. And Second. Amend the motion to reflect superintendent's contract. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming.